Good morning, everyone. I invite everybody to find a seat, have our time. So if you have clothing that you're looking to get rid of, please let us know. It is for any, um, any type of clothing, whether it be children, adults, women, men's, any type of clothing they will actually take and make sure that they can give it to people who are in need. So please let us know um, and please drop off items during the 10 a.m. service next week and we'd be happy to collect them for you and get them to the Vietnam Veterans of America. Shoes and boots as well, yes. Thank you very much. Excellent. Um, Sarah's gotten a new high school group going, and they, they meet Tuesday uh, mid-afternoon, 4.30 to 5.30 here. And uh, it's, it's great to have that. You know, nice to see the church, the group get large enough that you begin to say, you know what? Senior high has some needs that you can't just necessarily address in front of a fifth grader. So this, this is the time for that. And so that, that's very good that that's happening. And uh, we're grateful for... Uh, folk who are stepping up into leadership within the group. So that's, that's really excellent. Um, the Wilcoxes lead a Bible study. Bob leads a study at Romans. Um, Mondays, uh, 6.30, the gathering, 7 o'clock begins the study. Um, and one other collection that's going on, oh, oh, I didn't see that in my file. Great, Grades and Graces going on Wednesday at 5 p.m. Homework help, homework help. And uh, help needed also feeding young people. You know that's important. So, Missions Committee still collecting for the victims of the tornadoes in the southeast. Last week, though, kind of drawn it, to putting a bow on it. So, uh, let's get, get it done by the end of the month. That's one third. One other thing, talking about coming up in future months, um, not on the slides, um, we're looking, we're recognizing there are folk who are uh, becoming part and active of us, and, and you're wanting to make a, a claim of this as your church, and we want to have you. So we have our new membership class we call it Discover FCC Hanson. And that's going to be one of the first Sundays in March. So either the 6th or the 13th. And as we, we'll try to hear from you and what kind of time of day is best for that. But uh, let us know if you're thinking about joining and what, what works for you, whether it be right after church or later on. So we'll, we'll work that out. Good. Okay. Um, this, this comes in response to the needs of our area, you know, food insecurity is a real thing and you know what's happened to food prices lately and if you're unemployed, all those issues come to mind. So we provide meals to Father Bill's and Roadway and the Roadway Inn shelters in Brockton. When COVID hit, the uh, Mainspring House had to have the number of uh, clients they could serve and so a former Roadway Inn became dedicated as a homeless shelter and so that uh, we provide a meal to each place. And that requires money, it requires workers. Um, 
So uh, you can make a donation out to Father Bills at the, me the memo, can say Father's Bills. And uh, in the fellowship hall, also for our direct neighbors, there's a bin where you can donate groceries for the uh, food pantry. Um, Ellie and Carol can, uh, Carol Smith can help you uh, know what kind of uh, foods could be done um, if you wanted to make a direct donation in kind for uh, the Father Bills and Roadway Inn. What's next? Time for Glory of God. Um, great interchurch gathering next Sunday, the 30th, 6 p.m., Sacred Heart High School in Kingston. Gather to praise God. Gather to pray together, praying for um, real, true revival in our region um, where God's kingdom really becomes evident. And um, We will gather for our annual meeting of the church after worship on uh, the last Sunday of February. And uh, so for, in order to make that happen, if you are the leader of a mission, uh, of a, a mission uh, group, a committee, a board, any other officer of the church, please prepare your uh, report and have it ready um, by the 6th of February. Dinner and a movie um, on Saturday the 12th, 5 p.m., menu before you. The, a new movie in the God's Not Dead series, this one called We the People. Next. Um, that's it. And, uh, oh, sign up to receive the church email newsletter. Uh, you can email office at FCC Hanson. And uh, deacons, you've got the article this week. Anything else? Pledge envelopes, right. If you want an envelope, you need to make a pledge. Uh, and there's cards in, in your pews, I believe, that'll tell you uh, how to submit that. And then you can have uh, envelopes that you can make those uh, offerings and you know make it discreetly if you prefer so that's good Frank would always welcome more people to take part I am so grateful that we have a nice rotation of folk but we could use a few more to help make um, this not only the the public address work for inside here but also as we connect with our guests who are uh, watching from home or other situations um, I know uh, Stephanie Poirier texted this past uh, week that she was watching from quite a bit out of state. I forget what state she was from, but it was quite a nice little note that people can watch if they're homesick or any other reason. And to make that happen, we need people on tech. And thanks today to Nick, to Alex, and to Frank for being on the team today. Great. So that is our opening announcements. We are looking today at Jesus, our teacher. And let us be attentive students but let's also honor that we have this opportunity to be coming before the great king, the one who shows us the way, the one who is the truth and the life. Let's stand together and sing as our praise team leads us. Last week we learned healing is in your hands and I wanted to bring that back again. It just is a wonderful song, I think. <laughs> Yeah. Uh -huh. 
I love the scripture that that song is based on. Nothing can separate us from God's love. Nothing, not COVID, not cancer, not financial trouble, not unemployment, not any crisis, not the future, not the past, nothing can separate us from God's love. This week I was feeling troubled and I, I even was feeling afraid. And thanks to prayers from my small group sisters and my husband and God was so good toward me. He showed me that my fears are based on not trusting him not trusting him and um, the fact is he'll take care of me what am I troubled about and I know this here you know but do you sometimes not know it here and uh, so um, I wasn't living in that truth and uh, so I'm giving him praise for that and this next song is about putting ourselves in God's hands and letting him make the adjustments and I feel like that's what happened for me this week worship today comes from Psalms 51 verses 15 through 19. O oh Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. If you have no divine sacrifice, if I were to give a burnt offering, you would not be pleased. The sacrifice acceptable to God is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. 
Do good to Zion in your good pleasure. Rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in the right sacrifices, in burnt offerings, and whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. You may be seated. This is, you know what, oftentimes when we read about Zion, the way of us to understand it is that's where the people of God gather. That's the church. It's the church. So that we, uh, that we might be indeed rebuilt. The, uh, as we gather to prayer, remember that you know, so many different people through the, through the week, they submit the, uh, the prayers to us and they count on us, each one. And sometimes, you know, you only share a first name because it might be a, a sensitive situation. But uh, let's together lift these prayers to God. Heavenly Father, how much we thank you that you pay us this incredible honor of listening to our prayers. Oh Lord, we would uh, dismiss a small child who would tell us how to fix a car, but somehow you, you let us talk to you, and we thank you. Lord, we thank you that you are the God who blesses, who always works with the good of your children in mind. And so we thank you. We thank you for so many different ways that we see the evidence. We thank you that brutal cold weather can be managed by so many. We certainly intercede for those for whom it's difficult. But just that grace, we don't want to take that for, for granted. We also want to give you praise, God, for the wonders you did at the uh, Monadnock Winter Retreat for our youth, for... Uh, those who gave their heart to you this past weekend for the uh, the growth in you and the sensing of your call to to deeper devotion and service and we'd certainly pray for Sarah for Jonathan for Nick and all those who uh, really helped to make uh, the the youth fellowship uh, function as a, a body of your young believers Lord we thank you that you are the one to whom we can give our concerns, and, and many are sick, Lord, and we ask your healing touch on this boy, Corey, with a kidney not working right, and Shane, young and dealing with leukemia. For Lindsay's Aunt Sue, who's recovering from surgery, but Lindsay's uncle depends on Sue, and so would you manage all that and provide the support they need? We pray for Joan Delano's friend, Cindy, whose children are gathering with concerns about the incoming there. Hold them close, Lord. For my Aunt Doris with end-stage pancreatic cancer, watch over her, guide her safely to your side. For my Uncle Stan with stage 4 heart failure, hold him close. Hold his wife Marilyn and their children close to you. And Lord, we pray for Edna Howland, whose time seems to be drawing near. What a wonder uh, of servant she has been in this, in this church and community for so many years. We ask that you would be with Lori and all her siblings, and uh, that you would hold them close, and that you would comfort, that you would uh, ease Edna to your side, and welcome her with those words of well done, good and faithful servant. Lord, we pray for those who are affected by COVID uh, within the Matthias family, uh, also for Bobby, who's in the ICU, has added pneumonia to the COVID. Lord, I pray that he might take hold of you by faith in these days. Also for Alice Hager, that, um, that you would help them to treat not only the COVID, but also the kidney that's not working right. That you would, uh, Lord, show your power and your wonder. We lift to you, Lord, in our world, the, the dangers boiling around the border of Russia and Ukraine. We pray, Lord, for... Uh, all nations be able to dwell in, so um, in individual sovereignty that in each nation would enjoy peace, justice, righteousness in its leadership. And that, uh, oh Lord, you'd haste the day when men and women will study war no more. And uh, so give wisdom, Lord, and guidance to those who um, are responding and trying to keep peace. And Lord, would you put to naught the efforts of those who would... Um, seek to gain power and uh, so Lord would you uh, would you stop any warring hand from Vladimir Putin 
And would you cause, as you know, Lord, righteousness to prevail in this situation. We also pray for those who are unemployed, for those waiting for uh, situations to change so that they can return to making a good living. And if they need to change and, and what they're aiming for, that you would guide each of them. Lord, how we don't understand some situations begging to hire and other situations folks can't find work. So, Lord, you can make sense of this, and please do. And so, likewise, we also pray for those waiting on bureaucracy, on delays in courts and in responses from government agencies. Lord, we pray that, like the, like the judge who heard the widow's cry, you would cause those who are the weak in our culture to find the voice of advocacy and defense. Would you turn this spike of COVID cases into the end of COVID cases? And uh, Lord, hasten the day, we pray. Thank you that we can reach out to those who are insecure in their food um, and or their housing. And Lord, we pray you would help us and help us to welcome um, immigrants to our shores. Help us to welcome those trying to make a way and make the American dream their dream. And, but even more, Lord, would you make the American dream to resemble yours. Help us, Lord, to uh, honor you in all we say and do. And so unite us in heart and soul, even as we unite our voices to pray as Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen time to uh, dedicate our offerings. If there are uh, baskets in the back, you can always use the uh, church uh, website and the donate tab or the uh, QR code in the pews ahead of you. We'll take you right there to make an offering. Many people mail them to the church at 639 High Street in Hanson. Thanks for everybody here uh, watching online who helps to make the church happen. But we want to be mindful of the concerns around us. And we want God to shape us to have generous hearts. Um, also remember that we try to be responsible toward the coming year in how we plan. And that depends upon um, having a good idea. So, you know, a pledge is not a contract or something that we're going to send somebody down around to collect from you. Rather, it's just simply brothers and sisters in Christ saying, this is my best faith estimate. What can we do with this? So... Thank you again for your support. Let us give our gifts to God with a prayer of dedication. Lord, thank you. Thank you that yours is the cattle on a thousand hills. And so we can trust you to provide for our needs. Show us, Lord, and help us. And would you use the gifts we give to your purpose and guide us as we apply them to the missions and ministries that are before us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand and sing. Surely the presence of the Lord is in this place.
Our scripture reading this morning is from the book of Isaiah, chapter 58, verses 3 through 9. Why do we fast? Do you not see? Why humble ourselves? Do you not notice? Look, you serve your own interest on your fast day and oppress all your workers. Look, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to strike with a fist, wicked fist. Such fasting as you do today will not make your voice heard on high. Is such the fast that I choose a day to humble oneself? Is it to bow down the head of the, like the bulrush and to lie in sackcloth and ashes? Will you call this a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? It is not the, this the fast that I choose, to lose the bonds of injustice, to undo the throngs of the yoke, to let the oppressed go free and break every yoke. Is it not to share your bread with the hungry and bring the homeless poor into your house? When you see the naked to cover them and not to hide yourselves from your own kin, then your light shall break forth like the dawn and your healing shall spring up quickly. Your vindicator shall go before you. The glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you shall call and the Lord will answer. You shall cry for help and he will say, here I am. If re you remove the yoke from among you, the pointing finger the speaking of evil, if you offer your food to the hungry and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light shall rise in the darkness and your gloom be like noonday. Word of the Lord. Thank you, Skip. Wonderful passage. Most of you know that by now I try to do preach in series so that I'm uh, kind of covering things a little broadly, but also uh, trying to make sure prayerfully and with help from all sorts of sources to uh, give us a broad sense and not ride a hobby horse. And so these weeks before we get to Lent, I'm particularly wanting to give us a good look at some of the aspects of Jesus we may not normally uh, consider deeply. Uh, we'll look a lot at him as Savior and what the cross means throughout Lent. And I hope to do that in a creative way. But last week we talked about Jesus as healer. That's why we learned the um, healing is in your hands song. Today is teacher. Next week is friend. And that's a very important aspect. Don't miss that. But uh, we're going to you know, be looking at his, Jesus' life and ministry. And I want to talk with, uh, start by actually just telling a story that has to do with uh, one of the most courageous people I knew. Let's get that next slide here. And you might remember Bill Irwin. I know F Phil does. Wonderful story of this fella. He became blind as an adult, got very discouraged, but then found faith in Christ and somehow got the idea that because he realized that God could do all sorts of things through him in spite of his weakness, that he could demonstrate that by through hiking the Appalachian Trail from Georgia to Maine, blind, with his guard dog, with his uh, guide dog, Orient. And uh, I know I was talking with Lori Bianchi this week, and she's been uh, active as I have with the uh, hiking on the trail. And if you know, the through hikers are often given trail names, and they go by that name instead of their given name the whole time they're there. But they gave one name to, uh, back up uh, one slide there, they gave one name to uh, Bill and his dog, Orient. They called them the Orient Express true story. But amazing thing is that people didn't, people didn't um, complain as much, the long hikers. They didn't complain about their aches and pains or whatever, because they knew Bill Irwin was doing it blind, and that he was falling dozens of times a day. And he'd sometimes get lost. Um, but he got lost less and less as the hike went on, and he came to the conclusion, he, he said it was inescapable, he wrote a book called Blind Courage. Uh, about the journey, and he, he was convinced that um, Orient learned to read the trailblazes. Um, and if you're not familiar with that, now let's go to the white blazes. Um, white blazes are for the main trail. You'll find this in the Appalachian Trail, the Pacific Crest Trail, even on, the, um, I, on some of the telephone poles out front because we're actually on the Bay Circuit Trail. 
um, that long distance trails will often have white blazes and they, they have meanings and so forth. But uh, Orient would have to also know his colors because blue blazes um, are for side trails. And you know, they'll get you somewhere, but maybe not where you wanted to go. So it le begs the question, what kind of trail are you on? <laughs> have you gotten sidetracked? Um, you know, um, are you on a blue blaze trail? They say, they, some, they say somebody's yellow blazing when they say they're hiking, but they're really hitchhiking. And they're riding those, those yellow blazes in the middle of the road. Um, are you on a blue blaze trail in your life, or are you just stuck in the woods? Just ask him. You know, and of course, Jesus walked everywhere. Um, and that was partially a sign of modesty. You know, some of the wealthy, they would ride in chariots or whatever else. But though he was modest, he knew when to press the point. He knew he was God's own son, and when it was important, he made sure people knew it. And that heads towards our reading, which is Matthew 23, 1 to 12. Let me give that to you now. Then Jesus said to the crowds and to his disciples, The scribes and the Pharisees sit on Moses' seat. Therefore, do whatever they teach you and follow it, but do not do as they do, for they do not practice what they teach. They tie up heavy burdens, hard to bear, and lay them on the shoulders of others, but they themselves are unwilling to lift a finger to move them. They do all their deeds to be seen by others. For they make their phylacteries broad and their fringes long. They love to have the place of honor at banquets and the best seats in the synagogues and to be greeted with respect in the marketplaces, to have people call them rabbi. But you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher and you are all students. You have, and, you, and call no one your father on earth, for you have one father, the one in heaven. Nor are you to be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Messiah. The greatest among you will be your servant. All who exalt themselves will be humbled, and all who humble themselves will be exalted. So today we're going to look at how Jesus, the great teacher, uniquely leads us on the path to life as God meant it to be. You know, it's not hard to imagine a comic stri um, skit where somebody would be hiking and trying to act like they knew what they were doing. And really, they're just caught all up in underbrush, but they're acting like, yep, everything's under control. And sometimes I think God might look at us that way, that, that we act that way. Um, but there is a path, and he'd happily instruct us to it. But he kind of waits for us to ask. Um, now, when you heard that passage, you might have reacted like I did. Jesus said, call no man father. But what about my father? And what about St. Paul? He one time says to Timothy in the, in the Bible that he was Timothy's father in the faith. So yeah, it's confusing. Now Jesus affirmed the commandment, the ten, one of the ten, that says honor your father and mother. He talks about it in the Gospel of Mark. Well, the way to understand this is that he's talking particularly about the scribes and Pharisees in this. And they wanted to be known as father. This was something that they were kind of saying, I'm your, I'm your daddy now, is basically what they were saying. Um, and Jesus, again, I said this was assertive of him. He's saying, I'm the one. I'm the Christ. You have one teacher. One teacher. And you have one father in heaven in that kind of way. He didn't want the Pharisees with the way that they were saying one thing and doing another to become the spiritual authorities for this new community, this new way of life that he had come to bring. So he's uniquely leading them on the path. Now, Skip read to us from Isaiah, and as we heard that, we heard how God was calling for a radical change in the priorities of the people who claimed the Lord is their God, who claim to believe in him, who claim to be living for him. And what God calls us to is to be loving our neighbors completely, to love God devotedly by loving our neighbors completely. 
that if we weren't showing that love toward neighbor, we could not claim to be loving God. The, uh, the religious acts became merely a going through the motion. So it starts with the physical animal of your neighbor. You know, human beings are embodied souls. Your bodies matter. Jesus took on a body. But the people had made a mess out of fasting. Fasting is intended to, to seek a greater devotion to God by putting aside an otherwise healthy appetite. But they were, yeah, okay, I'm not eating. But instead of letting it teach them their dependency on God, they were kind of getting the hangries. And they would beat on people. They would beat on their workers. And they would show really a disregard for the ways of God but all the while in time, well, I'm fasting. That kind of thing. So, so the, the scripture says, look, you serve your own interests on your fast day. And you oppress all your workers. So they're doing the very thing the fasting was intended to train them not to do. So this care for the physical animal is important. Um, you know, and they excused their... Abuse of their workers. You're, you're, you're keeping the fast and you're beating on your workers. You know, with a lash. You know, like, a, like a slave driver with a whip. They excused their abuse of workers because they were from a different social strata. They wouldn't have done that to a colleague. They, but they would do that to somebody they said, oh, he's just a worker. But in God's eyes, disregard is not permitted. You know, they say the foot, the ground at the foot of the cross is level. It's where we all must gather. So the love of our neighbor starts with care for the physical aspect of their lives. Um, there was this sense going on that Jesus was contrary to and that Isaiah was contrary to about this disregard, this um, really antagonism toward neighbor instead of love and care. In both of the readings, you know, the, um, in the New Testament, the Pharisees, they were afflicting. They were piling up obligations on the shoulders of the rank and file of the people of Judah who, in good faith, believed I should do whatever they teach me to do. But it was more than they could bear and they weren't helping. The Pharisees, you see, had a rule for everything. They had, if you do it this way, you won't sin. But they lived a life of ease. And they could entirely devote themselves to keeping the minutia of the law. So compliance was possible. Not so those who worked for a living. So what they got for their troubles was guilt. Which, in turn, made them less in the Pharisees' eyes. Vicious circle, you can see it. Now, I say how the, the callous wore blinders. These were the ones in Isaiah's reading who didn't care the plight of their workers and others. Instead, like a, like a horse who couldn't see anywhere else, they only saw one direction and it didn't include the plight of the poor. So they indeed were, were callous. But this is not how God intended it to be. Um, you see, what... Jesus is always looking for is the kingdom of God, for us to live like God is king. And in the kingdom, there's none of this blindness. Instead, there is ample provision. Um, contrary to this callousness in Isaiah 58, where Skip read to us from, just three chapters ahead, God describes through Isaiah the way he wants things done. And Jesus took those verses from Isaiah 61 and made them the inauguration address of his ministry. If you were to look at Luke 4, you'd find these words. Jesus goes into the temple, he's given the synagogue, he's given the scripture to read, and he picks this passage. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor, he sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of the sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he uh, rolls up the scribe, hands it back to the attendant, and says, today this uh, scripture has been fulfilled before your eyes. And he dropped the microphone. <laughs> but it was a huge claim, because he's saying, 
I'm the anointed one of God. Anointed with the Spirit of God. Um, fulfilled in front of you. Now, the reactions to that <laughs> was just enormous. Because people knew what he was doing. But what he's saying is that God designed life so that all would have ample provision. That if we work diligently, that if we treat others fairly, that if we care for neighbors and family, and if we help one another through hard times, that there will be ample provision. And the contrary, the reason Isaiah got so upset at the ones who were going through the motions, but not allowing their heart to change, the opposite is that disobedience creates poverty, either in yourself or in others, which would certainly provoke the ire of the Almighty. But proclaiming that the way God wants is a way that leads to ample provision, that's why Jesus said this is good news for the poor. This is good news for the poor. So that's caring for the physical animal. Let's also look how God wants us to be caring for the social animal. You know, um, in the second chapter of Genesis, there's that verse that God says it's not good for the man to be alone. Now there's a couple of meanings for that. One is how men need female supervision. Exhibit A. <laughs> Exhibit A. There we go. <laughs> Clearly. It's a man who lives without female supervision. <laughs> Exhibit B. <laughs> yes, that is a lawn tractor trimming the hedge by being suspended from a large crane. It works. <laughs> Men need female supervision desperately. But honestly, even more, it's not good for the man to be alone points to the universal need for social interaction. We need each other. You know, I, I, in uh, the recovery community, the opposite of addiction is not sobriety, but community. We are healthiest when we have healthy interaction with others. So, to make this a little clearer, isolation is not solitude. Let's look at that. Um, you know, last week I talked about there's value in solitude. Um, it, it, you get your perspective right when you kind of turn off the noise and the tyranny of noise and just get quiet. But that's to equip us to go back into the world. You know, Jesus could have stayed in heaven. <laughs> Isolation. I always think of Paul Simon's song, I am a rock, I am an island, and a rock feels no pain. And what that's a song about? That's a song about somebody who's had bad interactions who's been betrayed, saying, well, then I'm just not going to bother with anybody anymore. And you know what kind of a bitter person that is. We've all known that kind of person. The solution to relational pain is trustworthy friends, not no friends. And yes, it takes risk. And every now and then you'll get hurt. But that's why you look for it among folk who love. And that's why it's important. You know, things we do, like the coffee hour that I hope you'll join us for afterward where we care for each other. That's important. You know, so the solution to relational pain is trustworthy friends, not no friends. But instead of, uh, instead of this, we find the uh, people who call themselves the religious hotshots of each day, the Isaiah day and the Jesus day, um, causing pain. The scribes are consumed with self-concern. You know, that you see scribes and Pharisees said together. And so like the Pharisees, these religious professionals had no idea how the lay people lived. Didn't have to be that way, but that's what it was. They had no idea how the lay people lived. You know, and if you were poor, you probably weren't clean. So therefore the scribes said, I got to keep kosher. And they stayed away, just built it up. And that led, if you don't see the poor, if you don't see the ailing, you don't care about them. What they did care about was being treated with honor. So instead of being concerned for others, they, the scribes were consumed with self-concern. You know, give me that nice seat up front. You know, give me the place of honor. Uh, you know, and this can happen. Uh, Dwight Moody was a famous evangelist at uh, the turn of, into, the, into the 20th century. 
And when he would give these crusades, local pastors would want to sit on the dais with him and they'd want to have a part in the program and they'd want to pray. And one Sunday or one crusade, one fellow was just praying on and on. And finally Dwight Moody stood up and shouted in this great voice that all could hear, let's all sing a hymn while our brother finishes his prayer. <laughs> Jesus was speaking against the scribes who were consumed with self-concern. Um, and Isaiah, in parallel, he was concerned with the pretend believer who hurt others with their false piety, with their, their false religiousness. Um, he said... Look, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to strike with a wicked fist. You know, it's not doing what it's supposed to do. We need to watch what, how we present ourselves. You know, I, like you, I am upset that overall, even before COVID, there was a marked decline in re attendance at, at worship. The solution to that certainly is not guilting, but rather for us to make visible what it is that God is doing in our lives. We need to have visible ministry. They need to see us feed the poor. They need to see us house the homeless. They need to see us defend the weak. I've spoken several times uh, with leaders in Hanson about the need for new housing that will address this terrible shortage. That means, oh, we don't have poor in Hanson. They can't afford to live here. Um, just as simple as a habitat house that we could build and make a difference to one family. Oh, that'll happen, but it'll take years. Why? Why? It doesn't have to. They need, the world needs to see us house the homeless, defend the weak, which can include the immigrant, the struggler, the woman in a crisis pregnancy. I was approached this week by a fellow named Julius Maena. He is a clinical social worker in Quincy, but he lives nearby. And he is the leader, pastor, of a congregation of African immigrants that live all over the South Shore, but center right around Hansa. And they wondered if we had any interest of, uh, of helping Africans. And, I, and then he saw the Kenyan flag in my room, in my office, and a few other things. And I told him our stories about our connection. And Julius and his elder are both Kenyans. So we're trying to see if indeed we might find a way that they can also use our building for their worship. Um, trustees will be looking at that. We'll have to find out what's the right thing to do. Um, we're hopeful. We've done it before. So we'll see what happens. But uh, so we're, we're looking at caring for the social animal, the relationships beyond just the physical needs of human beings. Because you see, in the kingdom of God, there isn't this double standard. There is authentic fellowship. Fellowship is a caring for one another, a treating each other each of equal value and of great value. You can see this in the first century. Um, in Rome, the crowded conditions meant that there was lots of rampant disease. But in the one particular poor area where there was a high concentration of Christians, the elderly lived longer than they did among the wealthiest because they cared for each other. Um, you know, small groups within our church, you know, we can love one another at, in manageable sizes. And then we look up for ways to reach beyond ourselves. You know, we had a great lesson from that when Doug Wicks came and talked to us about how he befriends the street people in South, in South Station. You know, what's, what's, what's he calling you to do? How can we show authentic fellowship that there isn't a higher and lower within the body of Christ? But there's something beyond the physical animal. There's something beyond the social animal. Because there's part of us that isn't animal. And God wants us to be caring for the soul. That's the part that isn't animal in somebody's life. You know, God cares for all of you. When the Son of God came to earth, he shared our common lot. And he declared that no one is worthless. He declared that every part of our lives is actually worthwhile. And... That does include the spiritual side. Now, it is becoming somehow sophisticated or stylish to claim that there's no soul at all. Our, our society is 
like two-sided on this. People will say, oh, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious. That's just fuzzy thinking. And then the, the other side is that you'll find a stripe of intelligentsia that say everything is biological or biochemical, that there's nothing beyond that. You know, but if that's true, if there's no soul, if there's nothing supernatural, then everything is equal. You know, animals aren't any more valuable than dirt in that. You know, putting a log on the fire would be no different than putting an animal on the fire. I'm sorry, or a child. We don't live like that, you see. We don't live like that. We know that humans are special. Of course we treat all creation with respect. But we recognize the image of God in all people. So we must care for the soul that isn't animal. So you are more than meets the eye. Is that idea. There is more to you than the uh, combination of the elements within your body. Because God made you for immortality. All right. Uh, yeah. So, um, let's see, what did I have here? One second. Oh, I see. I, I went ahead there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Okay, let's look at uh, the, second, the next slide here and talk about the poverty of the affluent. What I mean by this, poverty comes in many forms. Carol and I went to a college that had lots of uh, children from affluence within it. And it was remarkable, the number of them carrying such wounds around from being basically ignored by their parents. Um, wounded by a lack of attention from their parents. So poverty can not only be material, it can be relational. It can be emotional. You know, Isaiah says, bring the homeless poor into your house. He said, that's, that's the fast I'm looking for. And you know, when you bring somebody into your house, you, it really changes the game. It's not just keeping them at distance by giving them food or money or clothing. It's actually bringing them in. Of course, it takes a bigger challenge. But when you do this, you meet more than physical needs. You might be needing, meeting some of the needs that are at the core of what um, their struggles have been about. So part of the care involves caring for more than just the physical needs. And so what we do is we bring them into God's family. Um, we bring them here, we care for them, we get to know them. You know, if somebody is new, we welcome them and we learn about them. Because God's bringing them into our purpose, into our place for a purpose, into our family. Um, you see, when we practice hospitality, we care for the person behind the label. Labels are, I, I, I'm sorry, I think they're, they break things down, making things too easy that we can dismiss people. When we see people as they really are, I have to wonder if this is part of what Jesus was saying beyond physical healing when he said he came to proclaim the recovery of sight to the blind. When we only see labels, I think we're blind. All right. So in response to that, we need to treat uh, each, each new brother and sister that God gives us as God's gift to us. You know, church life goes through cycles. And one of the things that's been happening lately in our church is that we've been growing. And... Uh, we're coming out of the COVID pandemic and God is blessing us with a growth period and we're excited. And, and no matter where you come from here and you know, folks are visiting us in quotes by watching us online before they, they come to see us. But um, no matter where you come from, all of us, you know, we need each other. We uh, each need to uh, pledge to be the, uh, to one another uh, treating each other as God's gift. You know, that's true if you were baptized here as a baby or whether you're still not sure which door goes where. <laughs> I see that's a problem. <laughs> the reason God brings each one in is to make his kingdom more real among us, in us and through us. Jesus made a unique claim. He warned about false leaders. In uh, verse 10 of Matthew 23, Jesus uh, tells us, call no man instructor, for you have one instructor, the Messiah. Instructor could obviously be teacher, but it also could be rendered leader. If you think about it, the best teacher you ever had, you know, is often your a real inspiration for your life and the direction of your life. Um, in a real way, you set your life's direction 
from their teaching, from their instruction. They blazed the trail that marks your path. They went before you. They are your leader. Foreign language quiz. Do anybody know the German word for leader? Führer. Führer. Der Führer. Thank you, Chris. Gold star for the teacher back there. <laughs> um, Jesus is telling us especially to beware those who acclaim the authority that belongs to God alone. On January 30th, 1933, Adolf Hitler became Chancellor of Germany. Two days later, he declared, the 30th of January will mark the movement that started with the man on the street. And about the same time, foreign diplomats in Berlin misjudged Hitler's ascension to power as, and I quote, only a phase in the development towards more stable political conditions. At that point, on that day, uh, somebody I call my hero, the young Lutheran church leader Dietrich Bonhoeffer, addressed uh, the country on the radio. It was probably one of the first public criticisms of Hitler. The title of the address was The Younger Generation's Changed View of the Concept of Fuhrer or Leader. And he wanted to warn the German nation that a leader, that a Fuhrer, who makes an idol of himself and his office, and who thus mark, mocks God, is in fact a misleader. Not a leader, but a misleader, a Fuhrer. However, before Bonhoeffer could finish his speech, the broadcast was cut off. The word fell on deaf ears. You know, we, the other thing to remember is that Hitler started off by marshalling religious fervor to his aid as well. So, we must always watch for when leaders become misleaders. So, let's go back to our theme that Jesus, the great teacher, uniquely leads us on the path to life as God meant it to be. He's always the smartest guy in the room. Always. And contrary to this attitude of leadership by power, Jesus came saying, the greatest among you shall be your servant. He washed feet. His way calls for caring for the whole person in all people. Physically, relationally, spiritually. He's a great teacher who uniquely leads us on the path to life as our loving God meant it to be. He said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. And one time when Jesus needed to say some things the crowd didn't want to hear, many left him. And he said to his, his disciples, are you going to leave also? You can find Simon Peter's answer in John, the sixth chapter, about the end of it. He said, where else shall we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. So let us continually rededicate ourselves to following the path blazed by Jesus, our great teacher, and dedicating ourselves to learning of him through scripture, through worship, through service. Let us pray. God, we thank you that in you we find life. We thank you that you understand our life better than any earthly authority that would disclaim you. Help us to learn of you. Help us to walk in your steps. Help us to help one another and to be a people, a pilgrim people on a journey together. Thank you that you never stop loving us. Help us to be truly yours in all we say and do. For Jesus' sake. Amen. Okay. Closing hymn is, O Jesus, I have promised... 
If you're like me and you like the harmony, 648 in the hymnal. follow. Lead us. Give us strength. Strengthen the weak knees. And give us your grace. Fill us with your spirit. That all honor and glory be to God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and always. Amen.